Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about the pros and the cons of using either a drogue or a parachute anchor on a cruising catamaran. And this is all based on our first-hand experiences of using both methods while crossing the Pacific Ocean twice back in 2008. Now, one of the realities of ocean cruising in a catamaran is that eventually you're going to hit some heavy weather as they call it. And there's various techniques, lying a hull, um, you know, heaving to. But for a catamaran, using a drogue and a parachute anchor are the two prime methods that you will use. And so in this video, we're going to talk about them and give you some tips, pointers, so that you can make a decision on what's going to work best for you in your type of boat. Welcome to the Bee Catamaran Cruising Channel, where we share helpful knowledge, tips, product reviews, and info on sailing, cruising, and boat building to help you get out there and actually live the dream on the water. We are Carly and Garrett, and we built our catamaran over 20 years ago and have 20,000 miles of adventures in the Pacific Northwest, Mexico, the Sea of Cortez, the Hawaiian Islands, and crossing the Pacific Ocean twice. Subscribe below to start your adventure. We want to see you out there. Okay, so before we talk about drogues and parachute anchors, the first and most important thing about cruising on the open ocean is picking the right season to cover your particular passage. And in the Pacific Northwest, if you're leaving um, the BC coast to head down to California and Mexico, um, basically you have this window of you know mid-June till end of August to make sure you leave the Pacific Northwest. Any other time other than that, you're getting into gale season and you're gonna get some very challenging weather. And so the reality is if you're gonna go down to Mexico, um, you can't leave in June and do it in one go because you can only go far as essentially Ensenada before you have to wait because it's hurricane season down in the uh, uh, Baja area. And so you basically have to wait there till the November 1st to head farther south. And so this is a prime factor in planning any of your cruising is to go at the right time. And uh, Jimmy Cornell writes an important book about all the cruising routes, when's the best time. And uh, a lot of it is common knowledge, you know, where there's hurricane season and when there's not or typhoon season. But it's very important that you plan your trips using that knowledge. Otherwise, you're going to get into trouble. And, um, you know, we met several people on our trip, and um, they said, oh, well, you know, I've got a 50-foot boat, you know, I've got a big boat, so I can, I can go, you know, fringe season to make it down the coast. The reality is, on the open ocean, every boat, other than an ocean liner, is a small boat. And so you have to pick the right times, and if you do, if your boat is well found, you'll have a successful trip. And when we did our trip back in 2006 to 2008, um, initially our boat was only 28 feet long before we extended it down in, in Mexico. And so we went down the coast, uh, down California, Oregon, all the way down, and we had some 35 knots weather, but nothing dangerous. And that's far different than getting into a storm in wintertime off the Oregon coast where you might have 50, 60 knots, um, fast moving fronts where the seas shift from one direction go shift 180 degrees to the other direction creating very confused seas. So plan your trips using the right time and you'll have a good trip. Another point that's come up is that we hear these stories about people being caught in a hurricane you know off the Florida coast. Well you know trying to do a trip to the Bahamas or trying to go to the Virgin Islands in that hurricane season off Florida is asking for trouble and really it's totally avoidable you have to pick the right times to do those passages any other time you're just you're playing Russian roulette really and so we'd really encourage you to use common sense and realize that weather windows can shrink very um, very quickly these systems move very fast very unpredictable and though your boat may be able to do 10 knots um, it may not be able to do 10 knots in the direction you want to go when that storm is coming. And as well, here on the uh, Pacific Coast, um, in wintertime we have these um, low pressure systems that go from the Mex uh, not Mexican, Alaskan panhandle all the way down to Oregon. 
huge areas, 1500 miles. Well, there's no way to outrun the storm force winds. So be prepared, plan your trips, and you'll avoid most of the problems. Now, that being said, if you're gonna do a trip, you have to have certain um, tools in your toolbox to be able to handle these particular situations when the weather gets stormy. And um, when we went down the coast, Oregon and uh, down California, we had 30, 35 knots of wind at times. And uh, in our boat, essentially when we get up to about 35 knots, uh, we have no sail up and our boat's doing about eight knots under bare poles. It's a very light boat. And so that's kind of the limit where it gets kind of a little bit, you know, um, you know, we have to start doing something. But we never used our parachute anchor or drove all the way down to Mexico. Um, and we practiced it when we were in the Sea of Cortez, deploying it and so forth. And we're going to get into some of those details now. Now, when we crossed from uh, Cabo San Lucas to Hilo, Hawaii, this was in March of 2006, one of the key factors are is we had decided that the parachute anchor was going to be our prime method of handling the heavy weather conditions. And one of the things you do um, with a parachute anchor is it's important that you set it up before you leave port so that it's ready to deploy from the stern, from the cockpit. Now a parachute anchor uh, off the bow, that technique, essentially is you have a 12-foot parachute anchor, and ours was made by Paratech out of Colorado, and essentially it's a 12-foot parachute, um, two 50-foot uh, bridle lines, then 300 feet of stretchy line out to the parachute. And we had that all uh, carefully packaged in different uh, bundles that we brought all the way back to the cockpit so that when we wanted to deploy it, all we had to do was essentially throw it off while running downwind, throw it off the stern of the boat, the boat would go and eventually the boat would swing into the wind. And that's the best way to do it. You don't want to be going out to the bow of the boat, tying on lines, trying to get all this equipment uh, in the water and during the day would be hard enough, let alone at night. So we had practiced setting it all up so we could deploy it from the stern. And when we were going um, to Hawaii, it was, we had great weather, we had, uh, the winds were slowly starting to build, and we both remember the time we exactly got to the halfway point of our trip to Hawaii. Uh, it's 2,700 miles, and we got to the 1,350 mile point, and it's a kind of a very uh, uh, important time because you're keeping track of how many miles you've done, how many to go, and when you get halfway, You've done 1350, you have 1350 to go, and there's a great sense of, well, you almost feel like you're there, but you're only halfway. So we had this little celebration, we can remember it, Carly and I, very clearly, it was about seven o'clock, it was a nice, the sun, beautiful sunset, you know, we're doing about six knots, everything looks great, and, uh, you know, we worked it out, oh, we should be there in about another 10 days, you know, we're all so, you know, kind of excited. Well, you know, the sun goes down and what happens on the water, on the ocean anyways, is when it gets dark, all the motion gets amplified. You don't have the visual reference of the horizon. And same sea conditions, but it feels almost twice as rough. Well, it wasn't just getting dark, the wind did start picking up. Well, by about 11 o'clock at night, the winds were up to 30 knots. And it was getting kind, it was dark, there was no moon, and we were a little bit, kind of uh, unsettled with the conditions and so at first we decided we were going to set our drogue off the stern and we had the drogue set up now the drogue goes off the stern of the boat basically 30 foot bridles uh, 150 feet of line and we used a 48 inch delta drogue now at this time we didn't set up the uh, bridle we just put it off the one stern I guess it was the starboard quarter, and we tried that because the winds were picking up. We thought maybe we'll just slow ourselves down. Well, the motion didn't um, seem to subside, so what we decided is that we were getting, I wouldn't say scared, but we were a little unnerved, so we decided that we were going to set up and deploy the parachute anchor. Now, it was about maybe 35 to 40 knots. It wasn't really, really bad. It wasn't raining or anything and the winds were from the east, 
but we thought, let's put this parachute anchor out and settle down. So it was about midnight when we finally um, decided to throw it overboard off the stern, and we threw it out, and of course we pivoted into the wind, and now the bow is facing east, because that's where the wind is coming from. We want to go west to Hawaii, but now we're facing east. And there we were on our parachute anchor. Well, the parachute anchor, the point is, is it keeps your bows facing into the waves. So there's no way you can capsize because it's, it's like you're anchored almost to the bottom, but you're anchored to the water. The parachute 12 feet essentially freezes um, its position into the water. It doesn't move. Now, it's a very stretchy line uh, that goes out to the parachute anchor. And when I would go and check the line when we were on it, um, I could easily pull it in because it totally distributes the force. Uh, there's no jerkiness at all, surprisingly, even less than what you would get on a windy day just anchored on a normal anchor in a bay. So we were set on this parachute anchor, but what we found was is that you're facing into the waves and the waves come roaring by and they would hit the underside of the nacelle. And when they hit the underside of the nacelle on our boat, it was loud. And you know, you almost thought, wow, it's going to tear off the bottom of the boat. So we were on this, we were listening to the weather, and this was a, as they call it, an El Nina year. And um, they said that, well, there was an area, and this is how big it was, a thousand miles by a thousand miles, and the winds were going to stay at 35 knots for approximately two weeks. Well, this isn't just like a fast moving system that goes by put out your parachute anchor, storm goes by, pull in parachute anchor and go. Um, basically, nothing's going to change for two weeks. So, so we waited, went through the whole next day and we, we would check, the, you have to check the bridle, that's the other thing, you have to check the points at the bow every couple hours because you got to go out there, make sure there's no chafe and we had little big rubber hoses around the lines where they went through these big specially made chocks and we'll show you some of the pictures as we go and so I would go out there every two hours to check on it but we were getting a little bit down and what happens when you get down is you get kind of apathetic and like mm, I don't know if I should check it now and well I guess it'll get better and you get this little apathy and that's the worst thing that could happen but we picked ourselves up and I would go and check the lines and sure enough, you know, I would go out there and, and the line had kind of come out out of the chafe uh, tubing and was starting to rub a little bit, but fixed it all up and then we were set again and time went on. This is uh, the big storm we're riding out on our parachute anchor. went through that whole next day up to midnight so now we're 24 hours on our parachute anchor and listening to the weather same thing thousand miles square 35 knots not going to change for two weeks and so we realized that though we were safe um, what's the point in being safe if you can never leave and the thought of being there for two weeks didn't make a lot of sense so by the next morning so now it's about 30 hours on the parachute anchor it seemed that it, the winds had died down just a little bit and it was clear at this point uh, bright sunny sky um, it's not stormy it's just really really windy and they call it re the word they use was reinforced trade winds so we said look we can't stay here forever it's it, it was you know it was so uh, um, kind of depressing so what we did is we said look we're gonna pull in the parachute anchor and then what we're going to do is we're going to put the drogue out again, but we're going to put the drogue out on a bridle. So we had what is called a trip line that went from the cockpit all the way out to the head of the parachute anchor. And so this allows you to, in a sense, pull that trip line and collapse the parachute anchor and bring it all aboard. Otherwise, you have to actually motor into the waves pulling the lines over the boat, the bow of the boat, and uh, inevitably as you get closer to the parachute anchor, it would be, you know, kind of underneath the surface, and then you're trying to lift it out of the water. So the preferred method 
to retrieve it is to use this trip line. So we had our trip line, it was about a quarter inch line, went all the way to the head of the parachute anchor, and you know, you, you have to pull, you know, 300 feet in, and then when you get the parachute anchor on your boat, then you gotta pull in all the line, the 300 feet of the actual road of the parachute anchor. So I had this huge mound of uh, line in the cockpit. I tried to do it as fast as I could. I'm not sure how long it took. Maybe it took me a half hour, I'm not sure, but I had this huge mound. And at that point, we, we, we set up the drogue on a bridle. And this was the uh, you know, eureka moment of our trip. Because when we put the, the drogue on a bridle, now what happened is, is all the motion on the boat stopped. The boat, even though it was you know, still probably 30, 35 knots of wind, the boat was heading in the right direction because the winds were from the east. So now we're heading right back to Hawaii where we want to go. And the boat speed was now locked at about 4.7 to 5 knots. And so it didn't accelerate down and start surfing down the waves and slow up. None of this surging, which is unnerving during the day and really scary at night. And your nerves just can't take it. You know, this surging and speeding up hour after hour. But now we were just sort of locked in at this small variation. I would say it was, it was about 0.3 of a knot. And that delta drogue on 150 feet just kept us at the steady pace and took away all the slewing motion which we had when we were uh, sailing even under bare poles um, previously and so now we had this big pile of line which took I don't know, probably a couple hours to unsort it all out we packed it all up and now we were just going to use that drogue and we were on the dro drogue now for approximately two days um, day and night but, but we're, at least we're heading in the direction of Hawaii and we're doing you know f four and a half to five knots and so now we're at least making progress and uh, you know we estimated oh it's going to take us still another 12 days to get there but at least we were going somewhere and so this was a uh, real kind of confidence builder because now we knew that the drogue was the method of choice for our particular boat in these um, heavy weather conditions now we see a lot of catamarans out there uh, some of their videos um, uh, people like um, Ben and Ashley on Nahoa and you know they're on big lagoon 40-foot boats which weigh about 20,000 pounds or more our boat weighs 8,000 pounds soaking wet with all the equipment on it all our water so it's a pretty light boat so our threshold where the speed and surfing gets a little bit um, verging out of control uh, is at a much lower wind speed so at us it's about 35 knots we've got to think about slowing the boat down and making it steady to make it comfortable otherwise you know on a long passage you can't go day after day with two people you know just two crew dealing with the surging of the boat down the waves and so we have found that that's our threshold point 35 knots now on a bigger boat um, like I said a bigger lagoon or so forth it may be 40 45 50 knots but there is a point where you're going to want to slow that boat down because it's just going too fast down the waves and when you get to nighttime you you know the autopilot can't quite keep up and so it becomes quite unnerving so this was our first experience of using the drogue we used it for two days and then after about two days the winds quote unquote moderated and were about 25 knots and then we took the drogue in and then we just sailed at you know again that four to six knot speed that we were comfortable with that the autopilot could steer we didn't have to be on those on the sails monitoring it all the time and so we found that for us that drogue was a much better solution than the parachute anchor um, the parachute anchor we seem to be just uh, you know kind of exposed to the waves as they came roaring by us and we have a little bit of footage that uh, I think we're going to show right now showing the waves coming by and uh, though it was not extreme conditions um, it was it was it didn't feel as settled as with the drogue now another thing about drogues is at that time 
um, that was just about the point where people were starting to build their own Jordan drogues. Now, a Jordan drogue is a little bit different than the Delta drogue. The Delta drogue is a um, kind of a speed limiting thing. Uh, it sort of holds you at that, in our case, a 48 inch does 4.7 to 5 knots. Um, we may even, if we ever go down the coast again, get a 36 inch, which would we would deploy in sort of those moderate conditions and use it while having a sail out to kind of steady the boat. And we haven't experimented with that, but we would have a second drogue as a backup anyways of the 48 inch. But a Jordan drogue is more for, you know, the really bad storm conditions where you're in 50, 60 survival not um, survival type conditions and the Jordan drogue and you can look it up on the internet um, and we we'll put some links down below in the uh, comment section are basically a series of cones and there's this uh, it can be 100 to 200 cones depending on the weight of your boat uh, there's a length of the line and essentially it's a long rope um, that has a lot of uh, resistance through the water and the idea is that in real extreme conditions when you get those big uh, breaking waves, the boat will accelerate, but only go up to a certain point, and it has a little bit more give, but it's holding the boat essentially down to about that, you know, one knot range, as opposed to where we were doing four to five knots, and it was more where we're using a drogue as a controlling device. This is the Jordan drogue is more of a survival device, and we don't have any. Um, specific experience with a Jordan drogue but again if we were going to go down and do our trip again and do the same route we would have uh, our 48 inch drogue which we use now we would have a 36 inch drogue and we would also have a Jordan drogue for again those really uh, you know extreme conditions so that's how we found it on our first trip over to Hawaii now we went through the Hawaiian Islands for about four months it was great went to all the islands spent five weeks in beautiful Hanalei Bay and um, that was our sort of jumping off point to come back to Vancouver. Now um, uh, when leaving the Hawaiian Islands uh, you can basically leave there from beginning of June uh, to beginning of August because you want to get back to the west coast by the end of August. You don't want to start coming into September because in September you're starting to get into you know gale season uh, late September and even when we left we left on July the 5th uh, day after Independence Day in the States um, from Hanalei Bay um, on our trip back first part was idyllic we had five ten knots of wind from the east we were sailing in flat calm seas um, no swell um, just unbelievable water and sometimes there was not hardly any wind and we were just you know going at about one knot two knots slowly making away and I got we have some beautiful pictures I think we're going to show them now of the water and it was a, an incredible sea state but as you head up north the basic route to go back to the west coast from Hawaii is you head up north for about a thousand miles um, you know with the trade winds on your starboard side and eventually when you reach about 40 degrees north you can start to make the turn to the east and you're going to be in the westerlies and then you're basically sailing downwind again all the way to uh, Vancouver and when we were going you know day by day you know the 74 degree water slowly um, uh, cools down and it's 73 72 and, and now it's 68 and then eventually somewhere around day 10 you realize oh it's 58 degrees and the water's 58 degrees and it's foggy and you go oh yes we are going back to Vancouver uh, the tropics is now history so on our way back we had a very good trip and we were more when we were in Mexico we were much more um, apprehensive about the trip from Hawaii back to Vancouver than uh, than Vancouver uh, then sorry than Cabo to uh, Hawaii we thought that was going to be the milk run and the other one was going to be the tricky one but the trip to Hawaii was the one that we had the really strong winds and the other point I didn't mention which is not really relative to the parachute anchor is that when we were going to Hawaii and you're heading west one thing we never read anywhere else is you're sailing downwind um, in these super strong trade winds the, the thing that's happening we left in March beginning of March is still in the North Pacific you still have 
um, you know, storms and gales. And what they're doing is they're sending a north swell coming down uh, from the north into the area that you're transiting. And so what happens is you get this 10 foot swell from behind you from the strong trade winds. And then you got this 10 foot cross swell coming from these Pacific Northwest storms. Well, in that section in the middle where we were on the parachute anchor, there were some times where I would look back on the boat and you have the waves crisscrossing and you would get these pyramidal waves, uh, unusual shape. You, you know, it's like they say you have to be there to see them, but they would just sort of mi mix and just go pointing straight up and kind of disappear. And so that created a little bit of motion even in our catamaran. But I, we, we were very thankful we were in a catamaran because if you were in a monohull, that would not have been a happy time with that swell from, uh, you know, from 90 degree across directions. It would have been just a, just a terrible passage and really, really rough. Um, so we found that uh, it was tolerable in our boat and we were thankful for it. So anyways, back to the trip going back to Vancouver. So um, halfway through the trip, you know, it's cold. We're heading west. It's now foggy and we made good time and the trip was great but about 500 miles off of Tofino we were about three days away from Vancouver a week uh, there was a uh, low pressure area coming through and we found that they were predicting that they were going to have fairly strong winds and the prediction was for gale force winds so we'd already used our droke we were ready for it and uh, I remember the day we were sort of progressed through the day the wind started to build you know from the southwest you know 15 20 knots and around dinner time was about 25 and um, we were down to just the um, you know the, just the jib and we were making you know five six seven knots and it was rain this was a rainy storm it wasn't like the the clear skies that we had in going to Hawaii so it was a little bit you know a little more daunting because when you get to nighttime in the open ocean it's like being inside a closet there's nothing that you can see you can't even see the water it's just pitch black and so that's a little bit uh, disorientating and kind of almost creates a little vertigo because you don't know which way is up and so uh, I was uh, sleeping below and Carly was on watch it was about 11 o'clock and Carly slides open the hatch and says I think we should put out the drogue now and so I come running out, and sure enough, we're doing eight knots. And um, at this point, I think we had actually taken down the jib, but we were going too fast. So again, we put out the drogue, and we had it all set up in the cockpit with the bridle. And we put it out, and bingo, within one minute, it's all out, and the boats bang, 4.7 to 5 knots. And we went, ah. And even though it was raining now and windy, um, it was totally safe, totally stable, and we went. We at this point we stayed in the um, our center pod and uh, slept up there for the night as we alternated watches. And we went through the whole next day up till about five, six o'clock at night before it started to die down. And um, we don't have a wind meter on the boat, but there was a boat about 100 miles behind us, and they reported 47 knots of wind. So it was quite windy. And again, we would take the odd little spray because the waves would kind of break a little bit behind the boat and we'd get a little spray into the cockpit. But we were totally safe and the, the, all the motion is taken out of the boat by using a drogue. And so that was our second experience of using a drogue and we found it gave us you know, a confidence that if we had those type of 45, 50 knot conditions, we could put out the drogue and be totally safe. And well, here we are, 400 miles from Victoria. Carly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're on our drogue. We're going to see if we get a picture of uh, the wave action back here. Oh. We can get a really big wave curling behind us. Oh dear, don't say that. Well, it's for the camera. It's not all palm trees and surfer girls and 
surfer girl. Surfer I mean, Carly's my surfer girl. Well, I guess I'm not going to get a big wave here. It's almost like you're looking forward to it. <laughs> it's okay, it's not going to happen again, so don't just suddenly taking a bunch of pictures you have to start out for five hours. <laughs> really safe. And um, so, you know, we really you know we see the drogue as a better option for our particular boat now we have met people who have used a parachute anchor there was a couple in um uh, sea of cortez that we met and uh they had used a, a parachute anchor in the gulf of alaska and they were in like 60 knots they survived but um that was probably 25 plus years ago and um and we had met them about 10 years after that and they were in, you know, obviously very serious conditions and they used it. But the drogue, you're going with the waves and you're going with all that force behind you. And uh, we found it's very, uh, a much better motion in our type of boat. But if it was really, really strong, uh, you know, kind of survival type conditions, um, having a Delta, uh, having a sort of Jordan drogue would be um, your, your sort of tool of last resort. And uh, so there's a little bit of information about drogues and parachute anchors, our experience. And um, just to summarize that the drogue is the, we found to be the best for our type of boat. And really whatever type of size of boat you have in terms of a catamaran, there is some point that you're going to want to slow that boat down. And you better be prepared for it because, um, you know, if you get up to 50 knots and you find in your lagoon and you're going now surfing at 15 18 knots wow you got lots of force going on there and if you don't have things worked out how you're going to deploy it where your attachment points are um, and it's dark you're going to be in trouble and that's when things can happen and uh, you want to be, make sure that you have that that system ready to deploy as soon as you want to do it and in a sense it's almost like having a stern anchor um, we have a stern anchor on light wave, um, a little uh, five kilogram Bruce anchor, and we, it's in a it's in a mill carton in the back of the cockpit, and we can deploy that at the snap of a finger. And where our main anchor off the bow, you know, we got all these extra lines tying it up because it's a big rock to anchor, you know, of 15 kilograms, it's a big, big brute, and you know we want to have it properly secured. And uh, you know if we have to deploy that fast, it's three four minutes where the stern anchor, when we're in a position, and we were in a spot uh, back in June two months ago where the engine stopped, we're going through a narrow channel, and we took our stern anchor and threw it out, boom, stopped the boat, and we didn't bump into anything. So a, a drogue off the back of your boat, uh, you have it ready to go, and at a moment's notice, you're able to slow your boat down and basically relax. And um, the Delta drogue is the one we've used, 48 inch and that kind of locks us as I said 4.7 to 5 knots and it's almost like magic and um, your boat's controlled there's no slewing and you're able to relax and you just feel comfortable especially when you get into nighttime because it'd be one thing if you could sail across the ocean and it was daylight you could handle all sorts of weather but it's at night that that's when you you want to have the peace of mind that a drogue will provide for you. Well, that's a little information on drogues and parachute anchors, our experience. Um, like to have your comments below. Please, you know, put them in. We'd gladly answer any of your questions and uh, create a little bit of dialogue. Uh, we're here to help you pass on some of the things that we've learned to make it easier for you and help you to get out there sailing and enjoy the great outdoors and, uh, and do it on a catamaran if you can because that's the boat of choice for us but hey any boat on the water is better than being at the office on the 24th floor working on a spreadsheet okay well take care have a great day from garrett carly and of course lightwave bye for now watch the sun lift off the sea cast the shadow off a tree don't forget to subscribe to our channel 
and also hit the like button and also the little bell to be notified of our new videos. So goodbye from Carly, Garrett, and of course, Lightwave.